The City Riverbank Regular City Council and Local Redevelopment Authority meeting is now in session. Today is Oct uh, October 14th. The time is 6 p.m. Please uh, rise. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have someone from the ministerial? Nope. Please have a seat. Roll call, please. Council Authority Member Janine Tucker. Here. Council Authority Member Leanne Jones-Cruz. Here. Council Authority Member Darlene Barbara Martinez. Here. Vice Mayor Chair Cal Campbell. Here. Mayor Chair Richard D. O'Brien. Here. Conflict of interest. Any Council Authority Member or staff who has a direct conflict of interest on any scheduled agenda item to be considered is to declare their conflict at this time. Seeing none, we'll present, uh, proceed to items one, consistent of item 1.1, presentation of lights on after school proclamation. Good afternoon, city council members. Uh, thank you for having us here this afternoon. And we are, I have student representatives here from Riverbank School District. They're here to talk about our annual Lights On event, which is taking place October 24th, Friday, October 24th. Lights On is an annual event nationwide where there's about 7,500 schools throughout the nation that actually participate in Lights On. Riverbank is now in its eighth year with Lights On, and we have developed quite a celebration uh, with our schools. This year it's at California Avenue Elementary School where we expect to have five to 600 per uh, community members, uh, including students, at, th at the event, and it highlights all the work that the students have done after school in our schools, as well as uh, just highlighting the, the effects that students being after school, what that has the impact on the community, as well as the students. And so it's definitely a great event. So I would like to take the opportunity to have two students speak on our behalf for Lights On. Good afternoon, staff and parents. My name is Jasal Mahina Montalongo. I go to Riverbank Language Academy. I am here today to talk about 2014 Lights On event. Do you know what Lights On is? Lights On is when the nation celebrates 15 years of providing a safe environment for kids to stay until 6 o'clock. And that's why we celebrate Lights On. Thank you. Hi, my name is Saul Garcia and I go to Cardozo Middle School. I am here to invite you to the annual community lights on event. This event is to shine light on what after school means to over 800 Riverbank youth served each year. There will be games, crafts, snacks, prizes, and a variety of entertainment. This event will be hosted on Friday, October 24th, 2014 from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. at California Avenue Elementary School. We will be looking. We will be. We will look forward to having you join us at the annual community lights on event and help us shine the light for after school students. Thank you for your time. Come on, come on up. Well, that was so eloquently spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, and since you did that, I think we, as a city council, will take the uh, the action and proclaim, uh, whereas after-school programs provide safe, challenging, and engaging, and fun learning experiences to help children and youth develop their social, emotional, physical, cultural, and academic skills, and whereas after-school programs support working families by ensuring their children are safe and productive after the regular school day has ended, and whereas, there's a lot of whereas here, <laughs> such programs help build stronger communities by involving families, schools, and diverse community partners in the lives of our young people, thereby promoting positive relationships and advancing the welfare of our children. And whereas Riverbank Unified School District Project Action After School Care Together in our neighborhood has provided significant leadership in the areas of community involvement in the education and well-being of our youth, grounded in the principles that quality after-school programs 
are the key to helping our children become successful adults. Whereas Lights On After School is a national celebration of after school programs and promotes the critical importance of quality after school programs in the lives of the children, their families, and their communities. Now therefore, let it be proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Riverbank that Friday, October 24, 2014, is Lights On After School Day within the City of Riverbank, signed by the entire City Council. And who's going to accept this? This is a document that's going to be just up there with the Magna Carta. <laughs> there you go, here. Go ahead. Come on, Mr. King. Thank you very much. Come on, you need, you need a picture, and where's the uh, professional photographer? Oh, okay, you're on. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, everyone look at him and smile. One, okay. <laughs> All right, that should be good. And I thank you very much. Very well done. Very thank well you. done. Thank you. Thank you again. Children, thank you. No? My hand's not, my hand's not that bad. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Since I'm up here, I might as well stay up here. Thank you very much. Item 1.2, acknowledgement of the 2014 Teacher of the Year uh, nominees. Uh, we have two of the three individuals here, I believe. Is Jackie Withrow here? So we may have one of the three. Let's go on to Stacy Blevins. Come on up, Stacy. The others must be in detention. Come around here. Actually, uh, one of the teachers is, uh, he's donated a kidney, Mr. Uh, Ginelli. Ginelli did, yes. Yeah, 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 so he's the third one. I know. Uh, uh, yes, he is the third one. Yeah. But well, that is you, yes. <laughs> this is a certificate of special recognition, uh, recognition acknowledging your nomination for the 2014 Teacher of the Year, Stacy Blevins, Riverbank High School. The City of Riverbank appreciates your ha hard work and dedication to the students of Riverbank. Congratulations and best wishes for continued success, signed by the City Council. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we have to turn around this way because the photographer oh, shifted. There, there we I go. Just put that. There we go. But my mom's over there. So oh, mom, come on in. <laughs> mom, come on in. I know how important parents are. I have one. Okay, I guess she's not going to come in on the no. picture. Huh? Okay. okay, everyone got it? Okay. Now you Thanks get so to sp uh, say a couple of words. No. Well, then, I <laughs> then, then I will for you, okay? All right. She won't speak, but I will. Um, as most of you know, my father was an educator at Riverbank High School. He was? My teacher. He was? was he good? Uh, I had a history, and I was thinking that you kind of remind me of him a little. Well, good. Well, anyway, my father uh, was a, an instructor, a teacher, and education, according to Aristotle, is the, uh, the, the educated mind is, has the ability to accept new ideas without uh, believing in them. And that's what my father taught me, and I hope he taught everyone to keep challenging what people are telling you. And I've had the honor the last couple of years, but this last year saw 39 citizens of Riverbank graduate with a master's or above at uh, Stanislaus State University. And I was so pleased that we continue our, um, our increase of our education here in the city of Riverbank. So on behalf of the city council, we applaud all the teachers and those who have received the recognition tonight. Right. Thank you. Item 1.3. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. It is my pleasure to provide you as well as members of the community an update on the strategic planning session that took place on Tuesday, September 30th. Um, as you all know, we, we meet um, every six months to review the city's goals and objectives and including a SWOT analysis and then set objectives for the next six months. So tonight I just wanted to provide a brief overview of what the next six months uh, work plan looks like for the community's benefit. And it's always a good chance for, for us uh, just to be Re recommit to our, our strategic goals. 
So to begin with, just a, a brief review of our mission statement, the City of Riverbank is committed to providing exceptional municipal services in a fiscally sound and professionally responsible manner for our community. The vision statement, this is what we're working towards. The City of Riverbank will be recognized as a premier community where individuals, families, and businesses thrive in a safe and beautiful environment. Our core values that drive our work are professionalism, transparency, teamwork, respectful behavior, fiscal responsibility, integrity, and ethical behavior. Our three-year goals, enhance public safety. Um, it's often heard me said that if the city is not safe, a lot of what we do really doesn't mean much. And so I think this is, is a, very, a very important goal that is ever present as we, we go about um, setting our strategic goals. Improve and maintain infrastructure and facilities. Enhance professionalism and customer service. Achieve and maintain financial stability and sustainability. And retain and attract businesses. Under the goal of enhancing public safety, um, I'm just going to quickly go through. You can kind of read it on the screen. This will also be posted on the city's website tomorrow morning. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on, uh, again, continuing to keep emergency preparedness as one of our, our objectives as we go into the next six months. Um, looking to doing a speed survey at Claus Road between um, Highway 108 and Patterson in regards to just keeping that area safe by the high school. Um, exploring and presenting options for uh, improving the public safety along River Cove Drive and some of the issues that they are experiencing, particularly during the summer months. Um, looking at a, a broader base in terms of parenting skills and gang intervention programs in the city of Riverbank, that's something that the council has identified um, as a goal working with other nonprofits in the school district, as well as our sheriff's department. Uh, also, to engaging the community more and trying to take advantage of some social media activity. And the, uh, police, the chief of police is looking to do something along the lines of a, a link for community watch. So sort of taking our, our uh, crime tips process, taking that to the web. Under inf improving and maintaining infrastructure and facilities, uh, we're going to be looking at Patterson Road improvement concepts later this evening. This will be a, a discussion, uh, an introduction of some concepts, and then we're, we're going to be taking this out to the public as well. We're working on updating our water and sewer standards. Uh, we're presenting some of those this evening, and we have more that we'll be working on in the next six months. Um, and during the last strategic planning session, the City Council um, recommended and approved hiring an architect to develop some design concepts for ci city facilities, mainly the community center and the pool locker rooms. Uh, we're at this time, we're, we're getting ready to present the results of that work. We're also looking at doing a meter reading, automatic meter infrastructure improvement program. This will help us meet some of the issues surrounding the drought and use our resources more effectively. Um, that is uh, an RFP is out for that right now. We're going to be looking at Jacob Myers Park, looking just refreshing ourselves with the master plan, plan and looking at uh, some of the, the pros and cons of possibly taking advantage of some additional lease, uh, lease land and resources that might help us fund any type of expansion. We are working, continuing to work on the Nexus Fee Study. Uh, we'll get an update on that this evening, and we're looking to present the final draft uh, to the public uh, later on um, in the strategic planning session, probably the first part of 2015. We're looking at parking options for the regional sports complex. This is something that will be probably towards the, the later part of the work plan as we hit into summer of 2015, uh, but as we are looking at an increase in the usage of that facility, we're also noticing the accommodating parking, so results of success. Uh, we're also going to be looking at complete um, streets, storm, and low impact development standards. Um, this is an ongoing effort to upgrade our standards, upgrade our policies and procedures, particularly as we're anticipating um, development both commercially and residentially in this next economic cycle. We'd also like to complete an audit of sewer system management plan. Uh, this is to meet some state regulations. I, I must say that um, in terms of uh, the sewer system and stormwater systems, there, there's a lot of work going on in, in that regard. Uh, we also, again, want to take out some of the concepts for uh, Patterson Road improvements to the community and get some input on what do they, what do they see as the best option based on uh, the parameters that we have to work within. 
under enhancing professionalism and customer service, working again on using social media. That's something that we really haven't done uh, probably enough with, uh, so we're, we want to work on that. We also want to, um, again, consider performance-based management training. Our, the budget has not accommodated that, but it's something that's come up, so we're going to look at that again at mid-year. Also, too, at the staff level, we're initiating a leadership forum for department heads, managers, and supervisors just to work on developing leadership um, throughout the organization. We'd also like to, uh, again, refocus on customer service, dealing, uh, doing some internal staff training. So this would not be outside training, internal staff training, and building our customer service. We'd also like to, again, provide some training in terms of using social media, so setting up some guidelines and also doing some training on that to um, make the most of this opportunity um, in today's environment. In terms of achieving and maintaining financial stability and sustainability, uh, we are looking at an advanced funding agreement for potential future developers, so this way new development pays for itself. Um, we are also looking at a Proposition 218 hearing that is going to be um, dealing with uh, changes to our, our um, waste collection. And then we also are going to be doing an RFP for new accounting software and make a recommendation for a city council's consideration. Obviously, whether we have the budget for new financial software, that the numbers are going to tell the story, but we do think it's an important factor to bring to the council to make sure that we have the best software available. Right now our software is not working at optimum capacity and so it, we think that it's a, an investment worth considering. We also are, are currently in negotiations with the city's employee group, so we're hopeful to be able to bring uh, final agreements to the city council at the end of January of 2015. We're hoping to have tentative agreements before Christmas. Um, we also plan on reviewing the reserve policy for the City Council, just making some adjustments. This is a follow-up to the financial forecasting meeting that the City Council held on the 25th of September. We also are looking at using community facilities districts for new development, and so as a new development project um, comes to play, we will look into ne to negotiate that. That particular objective is really dependent upon whether or not a project is ready for consideration, but it is on our radar screen. We also are hopeful to be able to apply for a water bond grant for wastewater treatment plant upgrades to um, build on what we're actually in the process of negotiating right now. Under retaining and attracting business, uh, we are working with the Alliance and are planning to present a proposal for City Council action. <clears throat> and then um, we also are looking at uh, working on a draft package that we can uh, distribute in response to business leads and site selectors interested in the City of Riverbank. We get some of those through the Alliance. We get some of those just as cold calls. We also are continuing to work on the downtown specific plan, and we are uh, planning to bring that to City Council for action in, on January 13th. The Planning Commission has been reviewing that. Uh, I believe that they'll also be reviewing it again at the next Planning Commission meeting later this month. We also are, are looking at doing a, a draft market study of the comparative values for the Riverbank Industrial Complex parcels. Uh, this was a carryover. Uh, timing is everything on some of these, and so we've got that on the list for this one as well. Um, we also had um, some successful businesses. The mayor, myself, and Norma Torres Manriquez met with a, um, some businesses, I guess it was last, the end of August, and um, it, was really, it was really good just to have an opportunity to sit down and get their feedback, and the, the, this was one of the mayor's objectives with support of the council, and so we're going to be doing that again in the next six months. We also are going to try and reach out to property owners um, in the city of Riverbank, some of those with some key properties, uh, and uh, see if we can just open a dialogue with them to see what, what do they need to, to, um, uh, to know in terms of making decisions for the future use of their properties. We also set forth some future objectives that I'll go through in the, in the future, but we're just some things we know we can't do in this next six months, but things that we might be wanting to look at in future uh, in future um, times. The next strategic planning session has been scheduled for March 31st, 2015, and I will, I will come back in uh, probably the beginning of the year and provide an update before that meeting, uh, give you an idea of, of where we're going if we need to make any adjustments. Um, as as uh, has, was commented to me, I think, uh, by the mayor, it was a pretty ambitious schedule, this, this strategic planning session. There's a lot, we also have a lot of things that we're working on that are not on the strategic plan that are part of our normal operations, but um, 
think that everything on that strategic plan is something worthwhile and, and, it, and is important to the city's strategic growth. So I thank the council for support of the strategic planning, your active engagement, taking time away from your work and your families to, to participate in a full day session, and uh, look forward to accomplishing a lot in the next six months. That concludes the presentation at this time. I'd be happy to address any questions. On the uh, water plan, we have a, a final, we're going to be applying for grants, what was it, one March? Yes, so a lot of that will be determined by the, where we're ready to prepare when, we're, when we get the grant applications and having the, that prepared What would for. it take to get that plan developed and approved by the end of the year? There's a reason for that because one January is when the water bond comes, uh, you know, you'll get the language from uh, the state on how to use that water bond that if it gets approved and and if we're not if we don't have an approved water plan we can't apply for grants so oh, for the urban water management plan that's a here oh getting that approved by January 1 yeah oh I think that's doable okay yeah that is, our plan is to have that doable ultimately the Department of Water Resources needs to give its final buy-off but we have been in consultation with them throughout um, the development Okay. So I think that's, if it's not by January 1st, it should be very close to it. I don't want to miss out. But our, but our part of it will be done okay. by then. All right, no other questions? Move on to public comment. At this time, members of the public may come on any item not appearing on the agenda and within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council LRA Board. Individual comments will be limited to a maximum of five minutes per person and each person may speak once during this time. Time cannot be yielded to another person. Under state law, matters presented during public comment period cannot be discussed or acted upon. For a record purpose, state your name and city of residence. Please make your comments directly to the City Council or LRA Board. Do we have any public comments? Come on up. My name is Jeremy Fennell. I'm from Riverbank. Just to throw it out there real quick, uh, I'd be careful before you go into social media because the truth comes out and you have to be on point with social media, so just trying to, to get that out there. Thus far, the city isn't good at being called out or answering points, so that's just something that could affect negatively if you don't realize what you're getting into. So two weeks ago, I was here in this very location, and I thought we had a breakthrough when the city council voted that our shop, Sin Cal Industries, was a business of art and that the moratorium put before the council should not apply to business licenses applied for before September 23rd. To be clear, the moratorium was to be enacted so that the city could ban new tattoo shops while they took time needed to write new rules on how to protect Riverbank from new tattoo shops. I'm still in awe that the addition of a single tattoo shop would cause a need for such a ban. When we look further into this matter, we see that the new shop was to be opened by someone the city did not want doing business in their city. This individual was removed from Riverbank and has already been issued a business license and is operating in the city of Modesto with zero fight required. Just hours before last city council meeting, I was called and informed that I would be targeted by the new moratorium because I had applied to move my business across town. I was told that because I applied to update my business license, the city's stance was that I was a new business. When we paid the fee to move our shop, we were not required to pay the full amount to register for a new business license, but rather we were told to pay a smaller amount in order to update our current business license. Since then, John and Jill Anderson both told me that even though I'm an established business, the request to move across town warranted the need for the city to protect itself from us by grouping us with new businesses and the rules to protect the city from new business. Almost five years ago when I opened business, we signed a resolution to settle the city because we were going to open in what the city called the High Profile Shop Roads Crossing Center. The need for a business license resolution was not required if I had opened in a less visible location. Now because the city believes it must set rules for my business to protect Riverbank from SinCal, the city took the exact business license agreement resolution put together by myself and the city before Jill or John ever held their positions for the city and added four additional points, not at the beginning or at the end, but instead they jumped down a few and slipped in the new points. The new points are as follows. 
One, the operator and all practitioners so shall submit to and receive clearance from the police department for a background check. Two, the operator and all practitioners shall maintain compliance with permit requirements of the Stanislaus County Department of Environmental Health. This includes the inspection of the premises of the establishment. Three, the establishment will only be allowed to operate during hours of 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Four, there shall be no more than two tattoo establishments located within a thousand feet of each other. Distance will be measured by street distance or walking distance, whichever is greater. This to me would be like requiring a roommate to submit for a background check before you allow them to switch to a different, more accommodating bedroom in the same house. Or tell the same tenant that even though they pay rent and that they're good for the house, that they're only allowed to be home Monday through Saturday and only between the hours of 10 a.m. and no later than 9 p.m. Would you do that to a tenant you want in your house? Let's assume there are other established tenants in the house who are allowed, who are allowed to come and go seven days a week and any hours they find fitting to their needs. I can understand setting up rules for new tenants if you are the kind of person who's scared of everyone and everything, but would it not be discrimination if everyone was allowed free access so long as they are responsible tenants and then one day just because you don't care for one of the tenants you implement new rules only to apply to them and those rules are things like required background checks and limited hours of use? I've spent every free second I've had the past two weeks in locked in emails with the city. Every time someone's asked to explain the view of the city and how it's not discrimination, I've been handed off all the way up to Jill. To this date, not one person will defend the stance on the city. And all I've been told is the city has put together a set of criteria for your consideration. Unfortunately, you have objections and are not willing to agree with the criteria. So my understanding of the situation is one, because we decided to move across town, the city feels it must protect up against us by requiring background checks on everyone working with us. We've never done anything for the city to feel this way, and this does not apply to the other established tattoo shops in town. Two, because we decided to move across town, the city feels it must protect against us by limiting our hours and simply not allowing us to work on Sunday without appointment. We've never done anything for the city to feel this way, and does, this does not apply to the other established tattoo shop in town. Thank and you. Three, the city believes Sir? I'm the one to blame for not agreeing to the criteria that is clearly discrimination. Hello, John Foley, Riverbank. Uh, didn't have time to put together paper like he did, you know, although I have before. Same, same story another day. I'm ticked off at the city. I had my water turned off. I wasn't aware that I had a bill. I went down and I, I called the city and they told me I didn't pay my bill. My bill was misplaced. I paid my bill the next day. There was a 10% late fee. It was a $136 bill. I paid $13.60 late fee. They told me there was a $50 turn on fee to turn my water back on. I said that I wanted to dispute that bill. I paid my bill the next day. This city manager, Jill Anderson, said that if I didn't pay the $50 by Wednesday, she was going to turn my water off again. I said, hey, I'm taking this to city council. I've been trying to get you guys to work with me for seven weeks now. I've been here to the last three city council meetings, and I've talked to all of you on the telephone and here. I've explained to you that the city, the California public utility rules say that you must notify an adult resident of the premises, either in person or on the telephone, within 24 hours shutting it off. Tom Hallahan tells me that our water department is not a public utility. Well, geez, it seems like you're serving the public. That makes you a public utility to me. I don't appreciate that you didn't first of all, didn't notify me that you were going to shut my water off. I was home. They just shut it off. They didn't even knock on the door. Second of all, that after I came down here and appealed and I didn't have any money until the first of the month, which was five days, that this city manager was willing to let my family go for five days with no water to flush the toilet or to take a shower, brush your teeth, or cook. When she knows me, she's met me many times down in River Cove at our subdivision meetings down there. That is not the way you treat the citizens of your city. I did not appreciate the way that was handled. I was fined $113.60 for a 
$136 bill that I paid within 24 hours of knowing that it was even due. I've asked the city council to dispute the, the, the charge that they had, gave me. And today, finally, I get something at my front door. It says that it was delivered by mail. Do you see a stamp on this envelope? It says via US mail. And it's telling me that I have, if I want to appeal it, I have to, to put it in writing. Now, I talked to Tom Hallahan, our city lawyer. I talked to the city manager, and I talked to everyone on this city council. I talked to the people in the water or over here where I pay my bill. Not one person has mentioned to me that I have to put it in writing until today. This is the first time I got this notice. I would like to see the city turn around and change the way they shut off people's water. I told you this before, and I'm going to be here every two weeks until something's done. Until as long, and also, as long as the city manager works for this, uh, for this city, I don't want her here. I want a new city manager. You need to start looking for somebody new. And if you don't think I'm kidding, or if you do think I'm kidding, you just check. I'm going to be here every two weeks calling for her dismissal, her replacement, and the way that you change the way you shut off people's water in this city. It's not right that you go and shut off people's water without leaving a notice or, or talking to somebody first. And then having the nerve to say, well, you come back in five days when you have your money, we'll turn your water on. That's bull. That is not the way I want to be treated. I've been living in this city for 28 years. I'm highly offended. She told me that there's a lot of deadbeats in this town and that they know how to work the system. She put me in a category with people that I don't associate with. I don't know why she would even say that to me. I want this city manager replaced, and I'm going to be here every two weeks until she is. And I also, I talked to a couple of you about putting it on the agenda, about how we're going to do this with the city water and, and the shutting off the water. A couple of you told me it was going to be put on the, on the agenda, and it still hasn't been put on the agenda. It's been seven weeks. What's the scoop, guys? So I'm going to be a little bit more laid back. Um, my name is Anthony Fennell, um, and uh, the majority of uh, my businesses and things that I've started have been on the Internet. Um, I'm a bit of a uh, uh, social media guru. In fact, I retired when I was 26 with a company that sold on eBay um, to virtually every country on the planet. Um, and uh, so we're talking, I don't know if you know or not, but this thing going on here with the tattoo shops has actually went viral on the Daily Paul and some other uh, online papers that I write articles for. Um, I'm not here to butt heads with anybody. Um, I would like to see, now that I hear about it, um, his, uh, his concerns about the the water and when people get it, get it turned off, taken care of. That seems like a valid uh, thing to ask of your public servants. Um, just for your guys' record, I am a hardcore libertarian. I am a, uh, I've read the Federalist Papers, non -federal, the Anti-Federalist Papers. I can quote our founding fathers until it makes you sick. And the, what I would like to see in Riverbank is things like the food trucks that can't be here. They're ridiculous things that were made by people who are afraid of um, food contaminations and the studies that I could bring in and show you show that that's false. It's a uh, it's a made up nightmare by paranoid officials. Just like the 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 uh, <sighs> tattoo shop my brother runs, uh, apparently bringing in crime or something or drugs. It's it's you know it's it's really kind of sickening. Um, with everybody talking about secession of states, um, they're trying to go and get. Um, the Constitutional Convention, we were just a few states away from that. That's a huge deal, and it's because of things like that are happening in this city on a small level, just sort of branching out. And uh, sometimes your hands-off policies are going to solve the problems. I know Leanne last time has said, you don't want 10 people on the same block. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I want 10 tattoo shops. I want every open place in here where people could be paying rent filled with something. Okay, and I'd, if there was a tattoo shop and everything, this would become uh, a world sort of like, I don't know, an artistic wonder people would come and see that. The thing is, the people who couldn't do good work would be shut out. They'd go out of business because it wouldn't be lucrative. And the free market, when they're allowed to work, does that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not scared of competition. My brother is, is, is amazing at the things he does. He's a perfectionist. And you uh, would be wise to talk to him, um, although you didn't, about uh, regulations and things like that that you might want to put in place. But the other thing I'd like to, uh, to tell you guys is that there's a very limited need for government at all, period. People solve their own problems. I have traveled all over the world, and I could go and start a business in a number of countries like that. I come here, 
what if I want to start a food truck thing? That's actually one of the businesses that I've been starting lately. Couldn't do it here. I can guarantee you that if you made the threshold for people who are poor to be able to start businesses, you wouldn't have as many of those deadbeats that I associate with. You wouldn't have uh, as many of, uh, you know, people who are trying to find work or whatever. They would be the people who are out there. Instead of working for somebody else, they'd make their own business. That's what made America great. And the reason we're not great, the reason we're, we're horrible and we're, we're going down the tubes is because people have their hands in everything they're not supposed to have it in. We need to go back to, and, and, and we need to go, go, go and have our, our, our governments pulling out of things, not, not putting their hands in things. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, if we want to call ourselves the land of the free, I lived in Ukraine for a while, five years off and on. That was the land of the free in comparison to this. I was never afraid of the police. I was, the, the public servants were my friends, and uh, it was just a completely different atmosphere. I believe, uh, I don't know any of you, but don't try to enact... Like in this situation, there were people were trying to uh, to keep people safe. Paranoid uh, use of your time and creating unneeded regulations doesn't keep people safe. And in closing, um, I wanted to say that uh, if we're really, really wanting to uh, to keep people safe, first of all, we need to start getting um, safety measures uh, from our public officials because there have been some things happening here that is not. Uh, American. Thank you. Good evening, members of the council, uh, Mr. Helena and Ms. Uh, Silva. I'm sorry, Anderson. Uh, I just uh, wanted to, uh, Jim Gordon, Operations Com Commander for the uh, Sheriff's Department, I just wanted to stop and actually uh, say thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, I appreciate what you do. And I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Chief Kiley and his staff for all that they do. I know they had a, a successful uh, wine and cheese event this, this weekend. It sounded like everything went uh, uh, fairly smooth. And I attribute that to a good working relationship that uh, he has with all of you. Uh, law enforcement's a tough job right now. And uh, public service in general, as we, uh, as we uh, see a lot of different things happen in the city, as well as the county in general. But, uh, you know, it's important. I haven't had a chance to get out here and, and uh, see everybody as often as I wanted to. And I just wanted to uh, come out and thank all of you for your hard work and your dedication to public service. And also thank the chief and his staff for all of their hard work and public service as well. So for me to you, thank you. And uh, I hope you have a uh, good holiday season. Thank you very much. No further comment. We'll move on. Please, let's make it flow, not stop. Go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ramon Bermudez from Riverbank. I have been here a few times asking you for street signs. A few months back, I brought you a list of about 28, which 26 have been replaced, and three stop signs that are so important for traffic. As much as it is for cars, drivers, and pedestrians. But I still see now that they are rebuilding right off Oakdale Road on what will be Novi. Novi in Spanish means I didn't see it, so which is I didn't see the sign for a street sign for Novi and Oakdale Road. And I'm wondering, is it really difficult after so many months getting one sign for each corner there that says one walk the road and the other one says Novi, drive or whatever it might be. There is others right around the same neighborhood that are uh, missing or erased by time, burnt up. And every time that I have brought this, I had a couple of people tell me that, why do I be dead on a dead horse? I said, I don't beat on a dead horse. I want to talk to people that are very much alive. This is the city of action. And there was some action doing that. Maybe I should get another list of all of those three signs I recommended, suggested at three or four different times for all the people that work in Riverbank, the city of Riverbank. They have a minimum effort by the street they drive by or when they go to work or home or to go and, and, and have fun, whatever it might be or they're walking along and see a street sign, write it down. Put it, put it on, the, on a little note and put it to the city service department. There's nothing difficult about it. 
I don't like to be bringing the old stuff like they told me, why do you beat on a, on a dead horse? It's not a dead horse. It's just that either they don't care, whoever is in charge of it, or either all of you don't care. Because for you was a message. For all of you was a message. And I had said that, and I will repeat it again. Each and every one of the employees, mainly on the works department or the street department, should make an effort to write it down. They, they go and travel different places of the city for their work. That's part of their work. I think it should be done, and I won't bring it anymore to your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, my name is Edward Jones. A lot of people in town know me as Old Fast Eddie. I live at a trailer park across the street from O'Brien's Market. I put out a little picture thing for to let you guys know I'm at it again, trying to see if we can get some kind of sidewalk to put in that area. Uh, at one time, we were able to get a stop, a no parking sign, but the uh, it slowly got eliminated. Uh, ran over a few times. But anyhow, when uh, a vehicles or trucks park in that area, uh, I shouldn't say as being a truck driver, <laughs> but anyhow, when you're parked in that area, the people from the trailer park, including myself, have to get on the highway to get to go to McDonald's, the grocery store, or any on that side of the Patterson Road. I'm trying to push it takes 56 paces from where the sidewalk ends to the entrance of the trailer park. Uh, I went around the trailer park and see if I could find somebody to give me a hand to do it. But it's a senior trailer park, so I'll be out there by myself. I uh, appreciate it very much if you can do that. Every year I've been trying to push this thing. Uh, I appreciate it very much. I have the phone number and uh, for the, who owns the trailer park. I appreciate if you guys can do something or see somebody because I get a run around. I go to the, holy, at the, at the holy city yard and I see the people in the trailer on the right hand side. Uh, they gave me a phone number for Caltrans. I called Caltrans, and Caltrans tells me, well, we can't do anything. It's up to the city to make uh, a requisition and apply it to Caltrans, and then they can do something. And they'll let the city put in a sidewalk. Well, anyhow, that's the end of that. I have one more item. <laughs> the wine and cheese. I thought it was out of sight. At first, when you were, they were talking about shortening it, and uh, they did shorten it, but then they spread it out, which I thought was a hell of a good idea because they cut off right at the highway all the way down to where the post office is. I thought that was great. And all the concessions, and all the place, the things for the kids to play, like a little circus, I thought it was terrific. I went in, I was only there for about a half hour Saturday, but then I loped around Sunday, and there's a hell of a lot of people there. If it's possible to keep it going uh, with all the activity, uh, I think we're going to have a success at the Cheese and Wine Festival. That's all I have to say. Oh, forgot to take my hat off. City Council, my name is Rick McGinnis, and I live in Riverbank. And I have many hats, as you know. And today, right now, I get to take off my news hat and put on my Friends of Jacob Myers Park hat and my Historical Society hat and my Riverbank Citizen hat and point out to you a little bit of history that happened recently. Um, I have, have a picture you can see. 
with all the hoopla of homecoming week and the football game at the high school and the cheese and wine weekend, there was a quiet little event happening out at Jacob Myers Park. And I don't know if you were aware of it, but we had our first wedding out there at the gazebo. And the gazebo was, uh, this now kind of, kind of culminates, although not quite, about 17, year, uh, 17, year, 17 months of work on the project. It was first proposed by a, a Riverbank uh, Eagle Scout uh, prospect as his project. And the Friends of Jacob Mars Park provided the kit for him to build. He pulled his family and friends together uh, over, over the winter and got it built. And then since then, it's been landscaped somewhat. And I hear there's some more development coming. But this was the first wedding. And I, I was there for a part of it, having to get back to my coverage of cheese and wine, and uh, I thought it was pretty cool, the part I saw. So I think we need to be a, a little proud. Seeing no further public comment, uh, City Manager, do you have anything that uh, for item two? Um, in regards, I just wanted to let the count of the Council and the public uh, aware that we are continuing to work with Mr. Fennell in regards to the issues related to the tattoo establishments. Um, appreciate the comments in regards to government and um, also would like to um, comment Mr. Foley you know, is certainly entitled to his opinion. Uh, if anybody in the audience or the council does have questions about that situation, I'd be happy to provide an overview of that if there are any concerns about how we're treating our customers and our rate structure and why we are maintaining the integrity of our rate structure. I'd be happy to address that. Um, in regards to um, the food trucks, that is an, an issue that comes up frequently, and um, it's sort of a, a balance between those businesses that invest and pay taxes and those that don't, and finding a happy medium there. And it, it does sometimes, there are different, different reasonable opinions on both sides. I'd like to thank um, uh, Sergeant Gordon for coming here this evening, and, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant Gordon for coming here this evening and uh, thanking us for our public service, particularly the, the council and the chief. The chief of police was everywhere this weekend, along with Sue Fitzpatrick and her team for Cheese and Wine, and they did a great job, and I certainly appreciate Fast Eddie coming and thanking us for that and providing pom pr positive comments about the event. A lot of hard work went to it. It was the first year, and so um, the great news, everybody was safe. Everybody seemed to have a good time, and so looking forward to having a, a further debriefing on that. Um, in regards to the sidewalk, I uh, had an opportunity to talk to uh, Mr. Jones earlier today, and it is an issue with Caltrans. It's a Caltrans area. It's their responsibility. They're more than willing for us to take on the responsibility and pay to put the sidewalk in. Um, the dilemma, of course, is that we have a lot more needs than we do funds. Um, what I did talk to Michael about doing is, is letting the council talk about that particular project in context of the capital improvement program for the entire city uh, to, to see. Uh, again, the, if, if we had uh, an unlimited amount of funds, we would have probably put it in long ago and probably would have done a lot of other things long ago. So it's, it's you know, there's unfortunately just not the resources that we would like to have. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, I, I just have to thank him for presenting that, that picture. It just really tells a story. Um, Rick is really the unofficial photographer for the city of Riverbank and certainly appreciate how he documents things for our city as our historian. And so, Rick, thank you for bringing that. I think it brought a smile to everybody's face to see that beautiful wedding photo. And uh, it was indeed a busy week, and I think the city of Riverbank can be happy from everything at the school district to Cheese and Wine to Jacob Myers Park um, in a busy time. And it's just warming up because we've got the hayride later this month and the holiday parade next month, so there's a lot, a lot going on in the city of Riverbank. Just to continue on your comment, we had the <coughs> district executive director here from Caltrans, and he went through the entire city. And we documented everything that, and that was part of the documentation. And Caltrans has refused to do anything. They own it. If we take any, if we do anything, we're in violation. They put that medium down, and we had we had no say. So we have no say on certain things. And uh, eventually, we'll get possession of that. Then we'll be able to help you in any way that we possibly can. City Attorney, you have anything?
I, no, I won't add anything. So we got two items done. Item 3, consent calendar. Consistent of item 3A, waive readings. 3B, adjustments to city council meeting schedule of holiday observances. Item 3C, a resolution of the city council of the city of Riverbank, California, adopting by reference FPPC Title II, Division 6, California Administrative Code, Section 18730 and 18730.1, the 2014 Conflict of Interest Code List of Designated City Positions, and the Economic Interest Disclosure Categories. Item 3D, City Council to consider the following. One, award bid of the Central Avenue Pavement Resurfacing and Rehabilitation Project and authorize the city manager to ex uh, execute future change orders and to authorize an additional appropriation of $20,000 from the Storm Drainage System Development Fee Fund 208 for the construction of a French drain. Do I have any comments or questions or any item need to be pulled? Does anyone from the public wish to uh, comment or pull any of the uh, agenda items? So now I bring it back to the city council for a recommendation. I make a motion that we approve the consent calendar. I'll second. We have a motion to approve the consent calendar and a second. Councilmember Barbara Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz? Yes. Councilmember Tucker? Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Item 4, item 4.1, second reading by title only of ordinance number 2014-009 of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California, amending Title Three, Administration, Chapter 32, Commissions and Authorities, by repealing Environmental Review Committee, ERC, Section 32.70 through 32.83, and adding ERC Section 32.70 through 32.81 of the City of Riverbank Code of Ordinances. Mayor, members of City Council, um, an overview of this item was provided at the first reading at the last meeting. Uh, Mr. John Anderson would uh, be happy to uh, provide an additional overview and address any questions that the Council may have. I also wanted to point out uh, that we did receive some additional comments in regards to this item that can be considered uh, at the second, the second reading. Okay. I do have a question on that, Mr. Anderson. Um, this in no way makes this, this change still allows public comments, public open period, correct? Well, the, uh, the idea is that it... No, the, the entire process. Well, the entire process is open to the public. Okay. Um, no question. The ERC committee acts more as a staff committee with recommendations that are presented as part of a staff report that ultimately goes to the Planning Commission. And if necessary, if the project is a map, as an example, would go on to City Council. So at those two opportunities, the public would have an opportunity to participate in the process through public hearings. Yes. So it is a definitely a less formal process, and that was kind of the intent, not to eliminate it, but to make it less formal, make it more of a staff function. The only individual that would have made it a public would be the position of the mayor in that committee. Well, I mean, the way that it's currently written is the mayor and the chairman of the commission. And, and, right, those, right, I'm sorry. Yes. Right, it was the chairman so of the commission. So now it's taken by the staff and then goes through the process. That's right. Okay. That's correct. Any other questions? Are there any questions from the public on item 4.1? Please come on up. You'll have two minutes for questions, please, or comments. Good evening, Ramon Bermudez, Riverbank, California. On <clears throat> After Chapter 32, says commissions and authorities by repealing Environmental Review Committee, uh, I had the understanding that it's something that is existing as an Environmental Review Committee, ERC, or it's just uh, in the air, it's just something invisible. And if, if it exists, uh, an environmental review committee, where, where were they when uh, they started with McDonald's and, and then they went on with uh, 
KFC and then they went on with Taco Bell was there already, but then they moved and they still. And uh, then we have Burger King and then we have, when after Taco Bell moved, now it's uh, Carl Jr. And there is five or six drive throughs that affect very much the environment because of the small. I have timed it and not one car in the 12, 14 minutes they are online, mainly a jack in the box where I have a better chance to be on the parking lot. And out of 12, 14 cars online, mainly on the weekends, none of them turn off their engine. No matter if it is hot, no matter if it is cold, it's still they don't, they just wait and wait and run, run, run. And there is a good 15, 20 minutes of a lot of smoke and other, a lot of trash into the air. And nobody is doing anything about it. I don't see why is it they talk about smaller things that, do not pollute the air as bad, but they don't care about this big pollution being made, putting some type of limits, some type of restrictions, some type of healthier for the environment, therefore healthier for us who live here in Riverbank. Thank you very much. Any further comment? Bring it back. Is there any recommendation on item 4.1? I make a motion that we approve item 4.1. I'll second. We have a motion to approve and a second. Councilmember Barbara Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz. Yes. Councilmember Tucker. Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Item 6, 6.1, Resolution of the City Council of the City of Riverbank, California to replace in, in its entirety Section 5, City of Riverbank Design Standards Water and Section 6, City of Riverbank Design Standard Wastewater of the City of Riverbank Standard Specifications with new specifications and drawings. Uh, yes, Mayor, members of the City Council, Michael Riddell, our Public Works Superintendent, will pres be presenting the staff report regarding the, up the updates that we are recommending. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Um, basically, what we're going to do, and I'm going to do this rather quickly, uh, unless there's questions as we come to, towards the end. But so we're here tonight to, to uh, get a, a resolution adopted to replace in its entirety both Section 5 and Section 6, which would be the water standards and the wastewater standards for the City of Riverbank uh, specifications and drawings. So uh, the standards and specs are used by, you know, anybody that's doing any type of construction within the public works projects within the city, uh, within the city limits, and they must confirm to these standards. And periodically they're reviewed to conform to changes in the construction industry and the design parameters. Uh, the standard and specifications for the city of Riverbank actually consist of eight sections, of which we're bringing two to you tonight, which would be the water and the wastewater. As you can see, uh, the other uh, sections are listed there. So uh, city staff has reviewed and updated the standards for both water and wastewater. With, with This was done through a collaborative effort with Development Services, Public Works, uh, the city engineer, and uh, most of the field staff it took a crack at it one way or another. And uh, we re will continue to review the remaining sections to update them as we go along. So tonight's recommendation is that uh, the City Council adopt a resolution <coughs> to replace in its entirety both Section 5 and Section 6 of the City of Riverbank design standards and specifications and the drawings. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Are these are bringing us up to standard with the state's new requirements? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, I bring um, the item 6.1 back to the council. Make a motion that we approve item 6.1. I'll second. We have a motion to approve item 6.1 and a second. Councilmember Barbara Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Jones Cruz. Yes. Councilmember <coughs> Tucker. 
Yes. Vice Mayor Campbell. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 6.2, recommend City Council review and provide feedback on Patterson Road concept plan. Mayor of City Council, um, Mr. John Anderson and Ms. Kathleen Cleek will be providing an overview of some of the concepts being considered for improvements to Patterson Road. Um, tonight, this is just a discussion opportunity, get a chance to get some feedback at your since you're just looking at these for the first time, we anticipate that this will be a process that will ultimately involve some community input and a uh, community workshop as we go forward. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, John Anderson, uh, Contract Community Development Director. Um, Patterson Road kind of serves as a main uh, thoroughfare for this town in more ways than one. Obviously, it provides opportunity for jobs. Um, it also provides an opportunity to connect the east side of this community to the west side of the community. A lot of folks use it, not only vehicles and trucks, but also pedestrians and, and folks on bicycles. It connects the residential areas on the west side to BNSF Main Line to, um, to Riverbank High School off of Claus Road. So it is a significant uh, piece of transportation corridor that we have within this community. Um, it's, it's prominent. It is a prominent feature as part of the downtown specific plan and quite frankly the city staff has worked very hard over the last several years to put together a number of different grant applications to, to make significant improvements to this roadway section. Unfortunately what we have is we have um, an area that's got a number of different right-of-way widths to deal with and dealing with existing improvements and whatnot and trying to put together an adopted plan or adopted plan line, if you will, to make sure that we have consistent value improvements along this corridor is not something that's very easy to accomplish with the existing infrastructure that we have. So what we've done today is we've kind of given you, uh, or we're going to give you an update of where we, where we stand. Um, a lot of meetings have been held, a lot of staff discussions, a lot of different versions of what Patterson Road might look like in the future. But in the end of the day, you know, we are focused on putting together a top quality project and bringing this back out of, you know, just a planning document into something that the folks will be able to re realize is, is an important asset to this community. Um, Kathleen Cleek will talk about some of the CIP projects that are moving forward, but my function in all of this is to talk really about, you know, making this as complete of a street as we possibly, possibly can for the residents of Patterson. So after having given that little introduction. Patterson Road, you mean. Patterson Road, sorry. After doing that little introduction, I'll go through um, this concept. It was an item that was identified as part of the March 3rd, 2014 strategic plan. Um, the the goal, goal, obviously, was to complete some type of a concept plan and present it on to the City Council, which is what we're um, doing tonight. Um, we've had a number of meetings with both BNSF and also CR rail, um, Railroad representatives. And we were hopeful, fr quite frankly, that we would be able to work with them with the right-of-way that they have along, not only along Patterson Road, but also along the BNSF main line, um, especially as it traverses at First Street and then, of course, the crossings at Terminal and Third and then Eighth. So, Unfortunately, what we heard back from BNSF was a, a sound rejection to any potential utilization of the space that they have under their ownership. What does that mean? That means no sidewalks, no curb gutter, no, no curb and gutter, no street improvements, um, no landscaping, and, and no drainage improvements, even though you, know, you, you, you would acknowledge there's a lot of existing drainage kind of stuff happening along Patterson Road. On, on the north side up, a, up adjacent to this rail grade. So they'll be involved, BNSF, Sierra Railroad will be involved when we develop physical improvement plans, but what they've told us, we can't use it right away. So again, we're stuck using the right away that we have or right away we might believe we might be able to secure with future developments in the area, including ultimate development of the cannery site. So um, another thing that you know is that it's very frustrating from a pedestrian standpoint to get from, you know, Roselle, as an example, across the railroad tracks to First Street or Third or beyond to Terminal and then ultimately on to the high school. 
So it's it's a challenge, and it can, will continue to be a challenge. And unfortunately, we wanted to try to put together something that would handle the aesthetics of the rail line. And at least at this point, we're not giving up. But at least at this point, we're being told by BNSF that you know they're not interested in that. They're not in interested in any type of improvements that we might want to make to their rail line. So um, very very frustrating from our, our standpoint. Um, so w one of the concepts is, is to establish a class one bikeway and that would be a consistent class one bikeway along the north side of Patterson Road from Roselle all the way to Claus. We think that's very important. We also think it's very important to establish an accessible, accessible sidewalk along the south, south um, side of Patterson Road from Roselle to Claus. So again, that's, that's very important. We also need to acknowledge that both in the general plan EIR and in the downtown specific plan EIR that we have an obligation to provide traffic lanes to accommodate future traffic. And we're told that we're supposed to be able to accommodate between three and four lanes of free traffic in Patterson Road from Roselle to Claus. And I'm here to tell you <coughs> that that's going to be a very difficult task in a couple areas, and I'll show you. I'll show you just what I mean. So again, we're talking about beginning at Roselle Avenue and ending at Claus. We're talking about a plan that's going to take multiple years to build and implement, and we're going to tackle it, you know, one little project at a time. But we're intending to develop an overall goal and objective to build this roadway to accommodate some of the goals and objectives, and that is to make it a complete street which means bike paths, vehicular traffic opportunities, as well as the sidewalk. So what does all that mean? This is kind of a cross-section. If you look at um, Patterson Road, uh, Roselle Avenue, um, to Silicon Container, the, uh, the image on, your, on the, the right-hand side of the image would be the south side of Patterson Road. The left-hand side of the image would be on the north side. So we're talking about a sidewalk in that, in that area. Two travel lanes would be heading to the east, a center turn lane, two travel lanes heading to the west, a five-foot separation which required to meet class one standards, an eight-foot bike path, and then a two-foot little buffer area before you would start with the cannery property. What does this mean? Right now, we would need you know 15 additional feet from BNSF at the main track that's perpendicular to their tracks. They didn't seem overly objective, objective to that, but there are some significant switch gear that may get involved in that type of project, one of which is an electronic shift um, switch gear that's controlled out of the Bay, one of their Bay Area offices. So they're telling us that that's going to be a very ex expensive venture when we get to that point, but uh, that's what's being proposed. Uh, Monsheen Industries owns a piece of property right next to the BNSF main line. We'd need an additional right away from that property. We'd additional five feet from Mike's existing operation at the corner of Roselle and, um, Roselle and Patterson, and then an additional 15 feet from the Sun, Gange, Sun, Gange, um, Sun Garden Gange on the north. So again, to get the, this type of right away cross section, you know, we're going to need additional right away from future development in the area. Um, silicon container where we only have 75 foot of right of way you know we have to uh, do what we can with the travel lanes you'll see the travel lanes get a little bit smaller we've still got the sidewalk on the south side bike path on the north and we're using the BNSF and Sierra rail line as our buffer um, we, we may also need to, need to use it for storm drain but we think that's kind of an existing condition and we'll work that out through our improvement plans so as we move in front of Thunderbolt, our right-of-way width goes from 75 to 65 feet of right-of-way. So that's a point where we're going to have to have to drop a lane. We, ha we have no choice. We have existing improvements. We want to get a sidewalk. We want to get a bike lane. Um, we've discussed this with our traffic engineers, and they've told us we can drop one lane that, that travels in the eastern direction, and then we can transition that with our ultimate plan and then have two travel lanes heading west. So that's what this illustration uh, is to represent. The real problem area probably is from Terminal Avenue to Tina. 
This is where we have improved residential homes that are adjacent to Patterson Road, and we currently enjoy only 55 feet of right-of-way. Now again, I, I started this whole conversation by suggesting that we would be able to work with BNSF and Sierra Railroad to secure some additional land, 40 feet or so, that they're not using to help balance the right-of-way needs that the city has. And they have both told us we cannot do that. So I've gone from three lanes of travel, or four lanes of travel rather, down to three lanes of travel, have a sidewalk, have an eight-foot bike path, have my five-foot separator using a two-foot buffer on the BNSF um, rail line, but I've eliminated parking in front of these folks' houses between Terminal and Tina. So that is, that is a significant design concern. But quite frankly, in order to implement these types of elements, you know, short of securing right away from BNSF, we, s we simply don't know how to accomplish everything we need to accomplish. Okay. So... Go right ahead. What is BNSF's objection? Their object, they have several objections, but their objection is... I know it's my turf. I don't want you to step on my turf is the main thing. Well, I mean, the, fir the first, com first approach that we had was, you know, let's try to do something, a trail, an independent trail on the north side of their tracks, you know, between the tracks and, and the wall or whatever, basically just a weed area. And they said, no, we don't want any kind of, we don't want to promote any type of pedestrian activity there because those folks could be trapped between Patterson Road and the rail grade. And we said, okay, how about if we do physical improvements on the south side adjacent to Patterson Road? And they came back to us and said that it would not be acceptable to any of the engineers with BNSF and that their right-of-way is their right-of-way and cannot be used for our purposes. What is the purpose of their right-of-way? Is that for, for transport of goods and services associated with their railroad? Okay, and, and that's that, it. Is that for future? Do they intend on putting additional lines there? Well, I think there's been some discussion about double lining the main line, main track of BNSF, but not this, not this line, not the line that parallels Patterson Road. Now that now the line that pa parallels Patterson Road has joint. I guess I can say this is kind of joint ownership uh, or management, and it the actual ownership of the tracks uh, transitions from um, BNSF to Sierra Rail, Rail Railroad at or around Eighth Street. In fact, if you go out to the rail line, you'll actually see a line or a, a sign that says that that's exactly what's happened. But anyway, so I mean, it, we I can go into more detail with the mayor about you know, the conversations we've had with BNSF. The reality is that at least at, you know, staff level, and we're talking about this, you know, the, man, the real estate division managers that we're working with, they're like, they would not, they would not support any encroachment into their right-of-way for public improvements. And that includes landscaping, which is rather interesting. Yeah, yeah, very, very disappointing. We may need to bring in additional forces. We, we might have to. Um, and then uh, Tina to Claus, uh, we go back to an 80-foot of right-of-way. Um, we would have to redo the frontage of the Riverbank family apartments. We actually have the right-of-way there that we need. And at that point, we can return to the full five lanes of travel. We still have the bike lane, still have the sidewalk, still have the separation of five feet and then additional two-foot buffer. Um, my gut reaction is I think we'll be able to do some work with C the Sierra Railroad. They seem to be a little more amenable, but BNSF, absolutely not. And it's unfortunate, but it's the BNSF ownership where we've got this real constraint of this 55-foot of right-of-way that, that we're dealing with and not Sierra Railroad. So it's, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a bit complicated and, uh, and, and frustrating from that standpoint. I have a question. Yeah, go right ahead. If you approach Sierra Railroad and they gave you that right away, then I know what being that. Well, if they re if they relinquish the right away, then we have the ability to basically do what we need to do, yeah. right? But they're not at this point willing to relinquish the right away because that was old. That was the whole point. Hey, you got a hundred foot of right away in here. You know, your track sets only occupying a portion of that. You know, can we possibly occupy some of it? And we even shared with them. 
you know, pictures of what other communities have done. The city of Manteca, as an example, has done some improvements next to one of their main rail lines where they've, you know, put this, you know, fairly nice fence and then they've done some landscaping and then a bike path. And the reality is that was all on property that was owned or managed by the city and not on their railroad line. And they're not, in, they're not interested in allowing those public improvements to advance within their right-of-way at all. So anyway, Kathleen wants to talk about um, some of the capital projects, which are, which are the next slides that we're going to go through here. So let me advance that up here. Uh, here we go. John, before you go, I have a question yeah. about uh, on Patterson Road. Yes. The railroad crossing yes. by first. Yes. Is there any way we can smooth that out? Well, again, <laughs> Kathleen's going to talk about that, but oh, the okay. idea is that, yes, we are going to be smoothing, smoothing that out. Um, there is there's some additional work that needs to be done to, um, how do I want to say this, to channelize and to control the traffic at Patterson and First because there's a big area of land there that's all dirt between one of the rail fly lines, I'll call it, that comes off the main BNSF line that, quite frankly, is used by traffic to bypass, you know, stopped vehicles at the Patterson Crossing. So trying to clean that up I think is pretty important, too. So, yes. So the idea, but yes, a is, a, is a smooth right transition. And if you drive out there and you take a look at it, there's a lot of hardware. You know, there's switch gear and whatnot that's, you know, right in the way that's going to have to be moved, none of which is going to be very cheap. So, anyway, yeah, Kathleen. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, tonight, I'm going to go through the capital improvements um, right now that we've slated for this area. Some of them we have funding for, some of them we are still looking for funding and some of them are for future um, when development comes there'll be some additional improvements that we're going to need to make so the first um, project and you've heard of this project before is a signal light at Patterson and Roselle we have secured funding for this project um, it will be st we will be starting with the environmental and preliminary engineering on this project this month um, Construction should be 2015-2016, if all goes well. Um, of course, John told you about some of the constraints with some of the switches and so forth, because in some of those, the area there, we're also going to have the pedestrian crossing um, over the tracks. So we'll have some, um, we'll have to work with BNSF, and we've already started initial meetings with them, so that by the time we're ready, um, you know, we have everything in order. Also, we'll be making some improvements on the railroad crossing. This crosses Patterson. Um, it's between 3rd and Terminal. And we're going to make some improvements there. Um, tentative construction on that is 2016-2017. And then good news on this, this is a sidewalk infill project, and this is First Street to Terminal, and then also from Terminal to Claws. Um, the city was able to secure CMAC funding, um, so this project is slated for 2016-2017 with that CMAC funding. So what will happen is from Roselle all the way to Claws, when this project's done, we will have continuous sidewalk. Um, also, with the projects that we'll be doing on Roselle, we have we were secured some funding um, for CMAC funds for to improve Roselle sidewalks, and we already have one slated. So we'll be doing both sides. So go all the way down to Talbot. So there'll be a continuous travel. Um, a lot of buses are on Roselle, um, so kids can actually walk from Roselle all the way down to the high school or vice versa. So we're excited about that. Is that the southern limit of the project that John just described, that sidewalk? Which project was that? You know, John? Yeah, no, this, this, um, that's, is that well, sidewalk it, will, will not have to be redone? Correct, okay. correct. And that's, that's why it's wow. important for us to adopt or to consider a plan line for what Patterson Road might okay. look like with all the constraints that we have and I, and I wish, you know, we, we started off this whole discussion, and I wish we had 
better news to share about, you know, trying to get um, land from BNSF, quite frankly, that they weren't using. It was just a weed lot or, and, and wasn't part of something they needed to manage their operation. And um, at least at this point, unless we hear from someone up higher in the BNSF uh, network or organization, I mean, this is what we've got. So, so what Kathleen's talking about are, are improvements that would match up against what we think we can do with the right of way that we have. So in, you'll notice when you drive down Patterson, there, are, there is sidewalk in some areas. It's just not continuous. There's some infill that needs to be done. So um, with these projects, that, that'll be complete. So of course, the constraints we have um, on the other side is the class one bike lane and storm improvements. Um, from 1st to Terminal, and then from Terminal to 8th, and then 8th to Claws. We've broken that up just depending. It's a little easier sometimes to break up the projects and do them in phases. If we could get funding to do the whole, you know, complete project at once, we would definitely try and do that. Um, but I initially had broken it up here. Um, we still are working with BNSF, you know, um, it would be great even if they would allow us to use the, the, their property for a swale, some type of storm swale, just to kind of aesthetically improve it. So I'm definitely not going to stop there because I think it's important that we really fix up that area if it's possible. So um, that, that's the projects that we're working on right now. Um, of course, it's... We also want to get comments from you on the concept plan that we have because we don't want to make any improvements without um, getting comments back from uh, the mayor and council. And then also we want to hold a meeting, um, community meeting, get the, the um, feedback of the residents on what they're, what they're thinking for the plan for that area. Um, these are the development-driven projects that are listed in our general plan that um, because of development, um, we will need to make these improvements um, to accommodate the extra traffic. So the first one is an intersection reconstruction at First Street. It looks like we're having a slight technical difficulty, so we have a, a slight pause. We do have copies of the presentation in the back, and so for those that would like to follow along, unfortunately that won't help uh, for those in the television audience, but we can post those to the website tomorrow. And this will not be the first time that we have this discussion, but in, while we're working out the technical difficulty, Kathleen, if you'd like to continue. Yes, I will. Um, thank you, Jill. Um, also, um, after the intersection construction improvements at first, the general plan also um, identifies intersection improvements at 3rd Street, 8th Street. And so with those improvements, um, of course, we would follow the concept plan so that we're not taking apart any improvements we've made to put in additional improvements. So, so what are our next steps? Um, our next steps are to receive feedback from council and mayor tonight. Um, after we get direction, we'd like to schedule a community meeting with the public um, to get their feedback. and. We will continue um, our discussions and conversations with BNSF and Sierra. And John had mentioned Sierra. John and I were talking, and you know, the concept of trying to maybe work with Sierra first, make a few improvements, maybe landscaping, uh, 
bioswill or something, maybe BNSF seeing that and saying, wow, that looks pretty nice. Um, I don't know if that would give us any leverage, but it's, it's, it's worth a try. So um, we're definitely going to keep, keep trying to work with them. So. I want to piggyback. You know, the, the other thing is that I think it's an opportunity if you have had the opportunity or will have the opportunity to talk to other councils up and down the state of California and what they've done in their railroad corridors and working with BNSF specifically and whether they've had any success because quite frankly I'd hate for us to go through this effort to do all these improvements and take care of what we can take care of but really not take care of some of the other issues long term. I mean that rail grade forever has not been you know that well maintained and and certainly isn't that aesthetically pleasing for this community so I know it's a it's, it's a critical component as part of the downtown specific plan and I know it's critical for those folks that travel on Patterson Road and or live across the street. So um, we're, not, we're not giving up for certain, but I'm just saying we all need help in working with BNSF to convincing them that we need to do something other than what they're simply telling us, and that is to stay out of there right away. So it, it, is, it is critical. So anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good job for both of you. We've seen this, uh, your projects in your CIP, Kathleen and I uh, believe that they're very solid. Um, your, from my recommendations to you is exa exactly what you've done in your next steps. Um, continue working with BNSF. Find out from other railroads what they have been able to do. We're not asking them to give up their property. We're just allow, asking them to allow us to improve it for the entire community. And they are part of that entire community. If we have to, we may have to ask somebody to give us a hand who can do that. Um, other than that, your plan is as solid as it possibly can be, except for I would like to see BNSF become a good neighbor. I agree. Any other comments? I disagree with everything that you said, sir, and uh, hope that we can continue to work with them. And there is a little bit of light. The railroads are starting to get a little bit more pressure from the state. So that may be a little bit of leverage that can turn to our favor. So we'll watch that. John, I just had a question about, I'm not exactly sure. I think it was from like 8th to Claus where we have a lot of residential spaces and parking. Yes. So Especially from Terminal to Tina. Yeah. Terminal to Tina, that's where I've got 55 feet of right-of-way. It's very constrained. And without securing additional right-of-way from BNSF, it's very difficult for us to get, you know, in fact, I think the, my illustration was only three travel lanes, one, one travel lane east, one travel lane west, and then a center, center tr continuous turn lane. And we need that, quite frankly, because the folks that live on Patterson Road have to be able to access their property if they're coming from the east heading towards the west. So I thought about, you know, may, do we really need that and can we put that into parking? But the reality is that we need it just because the speeds of vehicles that are traveling on Patterson Road. So, yeah. It's, it's a tough decision. It is a very, it's, it's a very tough decision. I mean, you're not, I mean, the, al the alternative is to go in there and start, you know, condemning property, right, or securing additional right-of-way for that segment. But the reality is, you know, it's, that, that line has been set a long time, and those improvements have been there forever. So you're not, you're not going to do that. You're going you're gonna to try, try to work within the right-of-ways that you have, and, and still meet your traffic flow obligations. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. And we're not done trying to convince BNSF that they need to be a good neighbor. I mean, that's, I mean, quite frankly, they met with us a couple times now. And the representative we're working with, you know, he travels all over the Western United States. So he's well aware of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it's just, you know, I, I think it's just, a, you know, the BNSF has its own bureaucracy, you know. And um, they're just not willing to bend very much, you know, because they've got a lot of history in working with jurisdictions all over the place. And jurisdictions will say one thing, like, we're going to maintain this area that we want to occupy with landscaping. And 
Next thing you know, it becomes their obligation. It's kind of the same thing, quite frankly, that I'm dealing with 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 with, with, with Hatch Hatchy in San Francisco PUC. I mean, they're rewriting all their rules relative to you know their land utilization under their um, their right of way under their elect electrical lines, you know. And all we're wanting to do is do a dog park or something like that. You know, they're just not wanting, wanting you know, public agencies to control what they have. So anyway, okay. thank you. This is a public meeting. Any public comment? Ramon Bermudez, your bank. <clears throat> when they finally did something about um, Rosell Avenue and um, paved it and um, marked the lanes. There's a page four here about the Roselle Avenue to Silicon Container, Western Age. And I happen to live right across from their parking space, from their parking lot of Silicon Container, at 6261 Roselle. And I was wondering if anybody can do something about the very narrow lane that we have to go south on Roselle from Patterson Road. And why did they give whole mess of space that way coming on Roselle, right across all, all along, uh, right along uh, Silgan Container. I have had a few nights that uh, people were parking be before their house, uh, on, on the front of their house, from Patterson Road all the way up to Ward Avenue and a little bit farther from there, that um, they don't have their so-called courtesy light on, and they have their door open, and it's a dark it's a dark street and dark car, and we are about to hit to hit some people that are coming in or out of their, or their vehicle. Um, for some reason, I think that it hasn't happened, but uh, it's very narrow going south, but very wide coming north towards Patterson Road from about Ward Avenue. And I was wondering who made that kind of decision. At, at the beginning of the markings, they had the equal parts on each side. And I don't know why they came back and repainted it and made very, very narrow lane to go uh, south from Patterson Road on Roselle Lane. And uh, I get affected by that every day. There's um, maybe 30, 40 drivers that live on Roselle Avenue on the west side, and we get affected by that every day and night. I would like if, to know if somebody in charge of that project will just a little bit give us two feet a little bit to the middle of the lane so we can have enough space for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other further comment? Me again. Uh, with the construction going on on Clarabelle, don't you think we should wait and hold off for all this construction they want to do in the town of Riverbank? It's just a small town uh, put a four-lane road, even you do get the easement for the railroad, put a four-lane road on Patterson. Uh, I, can't, I can't see. Why don't you wait till the freeway is joined by the shopping center? We have an overpass already. What do you want to do all this mad construction? It's a nice town. Let's not make it into a city. Any further comment? I'll bring it back for Mr. Bermudez. I know he's not here right now. The, if you take a look at uh, going south on Roselle, from Roselle, it, the line painting was done to, uh, for the actual alignment of Roselle. Unfortunately, if you're going to do the complete alignment, if I'm not mistaken, you would have to take properties both to the east and to the west of Roselle to make that the alignment that it is designed to be. So the line markings meet the center line of the existing Roselle and the future Roselle. That is why we did what we did. And that is by design, not by circumstance. If I'm wrong, please throw something at me. So are there any further feedback on item 6.2? Is there any action other than to provide the feedback? So let's move on to item 6.3. Recommend City Council receive a presentation on the status of the Nexus Fee Study. 
Yes, Mayor, members of the City Council, um, we have scheduled tonight a very brief update for you on the Nexus Fee Study. We did have an opportunity to discuss this at, at some uh, degree of uh, detail in the strategic planning session, but for the community's sake, we do want to provide a brief <coughs> update. Um, I'm not sure if our equipment has unfrozen or not. It looks like it has. Uh, so we will uh, proceed at this point. Um, I would, again, just like to point out there are, are handouts in the back with the PowerPoint slides for those in the audience. Um, if anybody is interested in getting those or if a member of the staff could hand those out um, at this point. And at this point, I'd like to ha bring back uh, Mr. John Anderson. And, and just because I haven't mentioned it at this meeting, for those that are, are watching the City Council meeting for the first time on television, I do want to point out that there is no relation between Mr. Anderson and I. Um, just happens to that there's a lot of Andersons in this area. <laughs> so, so with that, I will hand Who's it over to our contract planner, uh, no. Mr. Ken Anderson. Uh, again, another another non-relative of mine that is our traffic engineer. So, uh, with that, I will hand it over to John. Mayor, members of the council, uh, the other part of Team Anderson here to present on the Nexus analysis. We have uh, obviously been working on this as staff for quite some time. Um, we've got a short presentation for you. Um, Basically, it's a tool. Impact fees are kind of a common thing up and down the state of California since 1978. Um, it's a way to, to, to gather funds to build necessary regional infrastructure, including roads, to support um, impacts that new development has on, on the communities. So um, as it relates to the city, the city first adopted their, their facilities fees in, in April of 2006. It's been a while since we've updated those. Generally, those get updated every four to five years. Um, the City Council in October 2012 authorized AECOM to complete a nexus fee study, um, which was to match against the newly adopted general plan. Um, that contract uh, is con has been consistently worked on, been worked on by staff with AECOM since October of 2012. Um, in in uh, October 13, we received the administrative draft of the study, and quite frankly, there was a number of issues that were uh, illustrated in that plan that really didn't make much sense um, in our eyes. And then we basically, there were some foundational issues that had to be corrected. <coughs> so as of that date, I mean, you can almost say that October 13th was really the go, st you know, the restart date for this whole effort. But in any event, we're, we're, we're nearing the completion of it. Um, this was talked about in the strategic planning session March 3rd, and that we would get it done before September. We, we thought we would have it accomplished before September of this year, and, and that hasn't happened, but I can tell you that we're about 95% complete as it stands right now. The, um, the intent is that once staff is complete, completely satisfied with the document, that we will be presenting that out to the development community and others who are interested or have expressed an interest to um, review it, and participate in it, and a ask the questions that they're going to have of the facilities that are included within it and the methodology that we've come come up with, which is in essence going to match what we did back in, in 2006, but it's going to um, include new improvement items and exclude and exclude those items that have already been completed. So that's that's very very important. And the other, quite frankly, is to make sure that we have implementation strategy that clearly articulates how you deal with reimbursements and how you deal with you know, maybe some fee incentives for job growth and development and maybe some fee exemptions for end users coming in that really aren't relying on municipal services, for example, like sewer and or storm drain because they're self-contained and or they're not needing additional sewer services. So those are all things quite frankly, that aren't in this, the current fee program that need to be cleaned up as part of this effort. So we're enthusiastic that we're getting closer and that we think that, you know, within the next, you know, month to two months, month to two months, as I looked at Kathleen, we should be in a, in, a, in a position to present it to the public for their review to go through that process and then ultimately to the city council for your, your adoption and consideration. Well, if you're at 90%, we started 500 days ago, so 50 days from now would be fine. <laughs> good math. Okay, good. Thanks. I, I appreciate that math. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any, any questions? 
I look forward to this being completed. I, 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 I know you do. We all do, Mayor. I we know. all do. <laughs> Is there any comments from the public on item 6.3? And then I bring this back to the City Council as we did receive a presentation on the status of the Nexus Fee Study, and I do greatly appreciate all of your efforts on this, Mr. Anderson. Item 6.4, review of the draft 2010 Urban Water Management Plan. Uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, this evening we have uh, scheduled for you a presentation on the City's Urban Water Management Plan, uh, the latest draft of this. This is a document that is required by the State. Uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Riddell, our Public Works Superintendent, will be providing um, you an introduction of this, this plan, and uh, we do have a brief presentation to provide you as we go forward. We do, this is being presented this evening in anticipation that we will have a formal public hearing in November, uh, in that, but this is, sets the stage for everybody to review the document, and uh, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to address them now or as we go through the review process. Mr. Riddell. Thank you. Joe, you know, uh, Mayor, Council Members, so tonight we have for you, for your review and the public's review, the Urban Water Management Plan. Um, we have been working on this for quite some time. Uh, as the Mayor so eloquently pointed out earlier in the meeting, is, is that we need to have this document in place for when that water bond goes, and that is our drive, Mayor, to have it in place. So um, basically we've been working with uh, Joe DiGiorgio uh, with uh, Stantec Engineering. He is their senior water engineer. Um, he's done a few of these, so uh, he's been kind of guiding us through the process. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe, and he's going to go over the review. So Joe? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, is the okay? I'm sorry. So we got the technical difficulties resolved. I hope. Anyway, I'll go very quickly through this. And this presentation is just kind of give background what the plan's about and some of the major points about it. And uh, basically, this was established back in the '80s. Uh, when there was rampant development going on, and there was concerns that some communities were growing faster than they'd ever able be to supply water to them. And so the legislature acted to require these kinds of uh, plans to be put in place with the hammer that if you wanted state funding, you needed to have a plan like this in place before they would uh, provide it, for, especially for water projects. But they've extended it to all kinds of funding sources are at risk if you basically don't play by their rules and get their documents in order. And uh, basically the act requires that every urban water supplier has to do that and they define urban water suppliers as having more than 3,000 customers, that's connections not people, and I think you're around 7,000 give or take a bit. Or if you supply 3,000 acre feet of water annually, so there could be places with fewer connections and let's say a big industry or something that might also put them into where they have to make these kinds of plans. And the idea is that you look at a, at least a 20 year planning horizon to look at your water supplies and then look at what happens during droughts too, such that you're not caught by surprise. and most of this was driven for uh, communities that aren't, that don't enjoy the water source that you have, which is relatively stable year to year. Uh, a lot of communities have to, uh, during droughts, buy water from other agencies, and it gets very expensive, and, uh, and that's why they do this. And, and you go through it so that you can be assured that uh, when you do approve your planned growth, that you're not backing yourself into a corner where one day you wake up and there's not enough water to go around in your community. And they've been due every five years since eight, 1985 actually and uh, you know it, it took a while before they started to come in and there wasn't really much meat to them before the 2010 version which is when they uh, instituted the requirements to actually set up a target in order to meet the uh, governor's target of 20% reduction by 2020. And uh, that year they actually 
delayed the due date because they revised the rules and the uh, analysis they wanted you to do and so they extended things by a year so it was really due in 2011 instead of 2010. But that was the uh, main change there where they, you had to set a target, look at what your water usage was and they have rules for how you do that and then you have to set a target to get there by 2020 with 2015 next year being the intermediate step like halfway there. Uh, just, I think it was last week or the week before, they've now made a further update to the urban water management plans and the next round of them, which is 2015 plans, uh, which will be due about two years from now in 2016, they just published new legislation on that and they're uh, saying that the Department of Water Resources will publish the detailed guidance in July of 2015. So. Um, you don't have to worry about having to jump right away and start planning your next one. I would wait until after they put the guidance up because a lot of effort goes into redoing things to fit their templates and to get the data correct in ways that uh, they want to use it. And this just goes over, you know, why they, uh, why it uh, is how it is. There was different, uh, and basically the legislature gets involved in water issues every year and tweaks things here and there. And this is how it comes down on your communities and that you have to uh, basically comply with the way they want to run things. So, and again, th this is, you know, the penalty. If you don't have the plan in, and it hasn't been approved by DWR. If you go to the DWR website, there's quite a few plans there. But when you st we had other clients that actually wanted to get funding and were told their plans weren't approved. And so I started going through, okay, can you show me ones that are? And frankly, not many of them actually were approved. But they're now going to where they're actually auditing them and checking on them and making sure that they meet the legal guidelines. They won't tell you how to run your city necessarily, but you have to meet the legal guidelines. And as long as you do, they won't weigh in on whether what you're doing is what they consider right, but they'll leave that up to you to some extent. But you have to meet the requirements of what the law says, and that's what they're going to check for. And so given what's going on in the stakes where we don't want them to come back next year and say, oh, by the way, it isn't good, uh, we've been working with them on this, and we're confident that the uh, plan as it is now should go right through with very little difficulty. Um, you're always free to, I mean, this is your plan and you can direct staff to change anything you feel that should be changed. I'd caution you if it's a major change, we'd want to talk to DWR about it before you would formally adopt it that way because they might have a problem with it and have to try again, basically, and we wouldn't want to go there. Now the other part of it is that if you don't meet the 20% by 2020 goal, the uh, legislation says that funding could be at risk too. Uh, you know, we can see what happens when people get there, but the good news is you're well on the way towards that goal already. And this just goes through how the uh, plan is set up for, you know, section one. This is also very formulaic. The, the laws and regulations pretty much say you have to cover all these items and uh, you have to document the public participation aspects, how it was made public when people had chance to weigh in on it. Then you have to describe your service area where you're responsible for the water service. You got to go through all the demands on water in your area based on things like the kinds of zoning and stuff. You can give estimates on how much water is used there, looking at your records and projecting ahead. Uh, then you have to look at your supply, which in your case is pretty simple. It's the groundwater. Uh, you don't have to worry about having to buy water from somewhere else. And then section six is a very important one. What happens when there's a problem with the supply or a shortage? And it basically has you go through a bunch of contingency steps for what would happen then. And during conservation steps, they have stages one, two, three, and four are getting progressively more intense as something like a long-term drought would build up. You have to go to further stages. Um, and that's spelled out in the document uh, what would trigger those stages. It has to do with 
losing a certain percentage of well pumping capacity? How many months have we been in severe drought? Have there been severe cutbacks all around? And what happens uh, in your case, since you have a pretty stable source, it doesn't really trigger automatically. And what's happened this year, you're, uh, you're probably well aware, and I know that uh, Michael's been reporting to the state, because of the drought, they've basically pulled the trigger and says, everybody's doing stage one at least by law, even if the guidance which is in your plan about well levels dropping and stuff like that hasn't really happened in your case, the state's saying do it now anyway and report accordingly. Um, then there's a section they want to they want to have uh, agencies look at the possibility of water recycling. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that but earlier, but that was something that really doesn't happen in your community yet because your wastewater treatment plant isn't set up to allow that use. And it is quite expensive to go there. Everybody would love to be able to do it, but believe me, it's millions to make it such that you could be piping water all around for reuse. So you have to be careful about uh, going there. And uh, we've just stated the facts that that's not in your current plans for now. Um, and then the last section, section seven, is uh, uh, demand Would management. Would it be hard measure. to change it if we decided to go that route? Uh, no, I mean, if you want to commit to water recycling, for instance, you can just put that in the plan. And right now it says, you know, there's no current plans for doing that in the immediate future. If you would like to state otherwise, I know DWR would not object to that. Uh, but, I mean, you'd want to work that out with your staff on what, what the realistic cost for that would be. We're working uh, that out. But one of the, th probably for the 2015, 2016 document, I think we would have a very solid plan. And that would be our addendum. Yes, sir. That, that would be the drive. Because as we see this water bond roll out, so then we can see how we can, can get into that aspect of it and the discussions you and I have had right. and with, with Snyder. <coughs> okay. And the demand manage management measures are a list of, uh, there are, I think, 12 of them which are considered best management practices. They had committees get together and decide what are the things that you can do to save water. And they want agencies to either commit to doing all of those or, since some of them cost money to implement, they actually give an out for agencies to do a cost-benefit analysis such that you're not obligated to do all of them. And that's uh, what has been presented in your case, and we've done that for certain other agencies. We work with a lot of smaller towns with the budget problems. Again, everybody would love to implement all of these all the time, but frankly, they just uh, don't make sense on a cost-benefit basis when your water essentially costs you around $100 an acre foot to deliver because you just have to pay for the electricity to pump it. You don't have to buy it from somewhere else or transport it 500 miles to get there. You know, other communities are paying close to $2,000 an acre foot by the time you pay, uh, do all that work. And for them, it really does make sense to spend extra money to get conservation. Um, and then there's some of the appendices have to, you know, cover to have everything in one document. All the resolutions need to be put there, the ones you'll be adopting, uh, the public notice. Appendix C, the checklist, is really there to help a, us and staff make sure we've done a reasonable job, and B, help DWR just go down the checklist and not get lost on what we've done. Uh, e has your ordinances. F has a sample emergency resolutions showing that, you know, if you have a water emergency, it's an example of the kind of uh, resolution that you as a council may adopt to deal with that kind of an emergency. It's, there's an example in the appendix, and it's, you know, very broad because it just says you have to say what's happened and why and what your steps are going to be to deal with it in the immediate future to keep water, at least for health and human safety, available during such an emergency. And then Appendix G has some of the backup of the cost-benefit analysis information for the demand management measures and conservation ones, which you aren't going to implement right away. Um, anyway, the analysis is that, you know, we looked at your historic water use, uh, 
basically from the year 2000 and defined the baseline using their formulas. And we then looked at your uh, city general plan growth plans and built that in going out 20 years, just like they're saying, and figured out how much water you'll need and confirmed that your aquifer will be able to supply that. You'll need to put more wells in, but that's part of your plan. You don't have to have those all in place from day one. But you do have to know that the groundwater will be there. And as far as the 20 year planning horizon, it looks good. There's issues statewide with groundwater and they've got legislation about that now that'll change the horizon somewhat. But uh, you're in a pretty good position. Um, yeah, we went through the demand management pr program instead of adopting all of them, which is the easy way to do it if you have the money we had to go through and show which ones would be adopted and which ones are not feasible right now. Uh, we prepared a draft report, submitted it to DWR to have them do a pre-review so that we wouldn't waste your time bringing you something that was just going to be rejected by them. And we've gone through that step. They had some uh, helpful comments that we've addressed and uh, we think we're uh, ready to go on it. You got sound water supply for at least the next 20 years. Um, you do probably want to formalize and keep working on maybe having some more robust emergency and catastrophic response plans working with the other communities around you. Uh, again, the chance of something major happening is, uh, is remote, but uh, I mean the biggest thing we could think of is like a very prolonged power outage and you'd be on you know, generators for a long time and start having to have fuel trucked in anyway. It's stuff that you can manage and staff's thought about, but um, just want to work with other agencies so you can work together if anything like that ever really happens here. Um, then if, there, if you need emergency restrictions, that's something that'll be in your court to actually adopt any uh, emergency ordinances that would address that. Uh, and it could get all the way where you like ban outdoor water use. It's, some communities have gone that far in prior droughts where it's just an outright ban. But again, cross our fingers, we don't think you have to worry about going there right away. And then, especially for the next uh, round of this uh, reporting and all the way to 2020, you'll want to keep an eye on the water use and maybe institute some more of the water saving um, demand management measures too and also if you have other ideas they won't stop you from doing that but they have the ones you must address. This just gets into how they track the water use gallons per capita per day for your service area and this is some of the figures. Your baseline during the period we looked at was about 207 gallons per person per day and uh, that compares to the average in the area of, of somewhat more than that about uh, the, the average is about 10% higher over that period, and it ranges from very low to very high uh, on that. And I forget which communities they are, but uh, it shows you where you fit. Using that, uh, we had to project for 2015 to get to the 2020 goal, which is 165 gallons per capita per day. You should be at least at 187 gallons per capita per day or lower. And the good news is you're already there. You're at 100. You're almost at the 20 percent by 2020 goal within you know plus or minus a few gallons per day. And uh, I know that this year you're even doing even better. Michael's been reporting numbers to the state, and they're not directly comparable because they're just months in the summer months when water use is higher, but after you have another full year, you use some confident you'll look at that and you'll be below your 20 percent by 2020 goal uh, by the time the, the uh, total year's worth of water is looked at. And this is just a quick run through the uh, demand management measures just so you understand which ones in working with your staff it was determined would be feasible or not. The demand management A is a water survey program uh, residential where basically you'd need to hire uh, staff, we figured half time would be a reasonable allowance and then it gets into going out to the different households and basically going inside and doing a water audit. Some agencies can do that, bigger towns, like I live in Sacramento and they do provide that service, but 
For here, we looked at it would cost the city approximately $65,000 a year to implement such a program, and it would probably only save about $3,000 worth of water. So using that, you don't have to do it. You're always free to do it if you want to, but uh, it doesn't make sense economically straight up, so you're not required to. Um, B is residential plumbing retrofit. We're saying that's not currently feasible, too, because uh, of the staff time and uh, effort that would be involved, and we would probably have even less payback, maybe just $1,000 a water year would be saved. And the other thing about that is that you've already implemented the green building code, which is by law going to require a lot of this retrofit work to happen anyway, so why would you go and basically try to grease the skids on something that is set into state law essentially anyway. Um, see the water system audits that have, that, that has to do with keeping track of how much leakage you have in from your system. It's about half a percent, give or take, of your water that you pump out of the ground is lost somewhere along the way through leaks or just maybe the meters aren't reading correctly. And I know you're addressing that with maybe getting electronic meters and stuff. That will all be part of incrementally getting better at that, but that is something we're saying you've got already implemented. The uh, commodity rate metering, that has to do with charging people by how much water you use. Some agencies do that, some don't, and you do that so you're already there. You don't have to make an excuse not to. And I know you're working on, on water rates right now, and so you can look at that. One thing they like to see is that you've accounted for as people can serve and use less water, if your rates are based on how much they use, that you've accounted for that and don't say, hey, everybody's conserving and now we got to raise our rates to cover it because we didn't factor that in. Uh, so it's just something to caution is when you have uh, the water rate study to make sure that it has realistic estimates on how much people will be using uh, and you should probably assume they're using less than they are today long term to set your rates to be solid for the long term. Uh, the large landscape conservation program, again, that's not currently feasible. We ran the numbers. And that's something else, too. The uh, model landscape uh, code that has been adopted by your community essentially covers that. So given time, you'll already get the benefits of that and not have to institute a special program. Uh, Demand Management F has to do with high efficiency washing machine program and pg e is already offering something like that and city staff uh, has committed to making sure that you'll help residents take advantage of that but you're not going to fund one where you're going to be instituting rebates on your own because again the cost of that compared to the amount of water you would save isn't, um, doesn't, the math doesn't work right. The uh, G public information program, that's something you are doing. And I know that uh, Kathleen has sent me pictures from Beyond Earth Day and stuff where you set up a, a table and, and have information available. And I know uh, at the other city offices, I've seen the information you have available too. And that's part of educating people uh, on efforts they can do to conserve. Um, there's also for commercial, you don't have that many commercial accounts and industrial where it makes sense. So again, that doesn't go there. Plus, you're already charging them for water and as businesses. That's a pretty good incentive for them to find ways to not waste it. Um, you're not a wholesale agency, so you, that, that one's not applicable. Your conservation pricing is a place. L is having a water conservation coordinator, and, and, and Kathleen is the one who is step forward to be designated in that role and that involves keeping track of how well things like this are going, make sure the, that your programs are coordinated and uh, do the accounting to make sure it keeps uh, being effective. And it's also someone to call if, if people in the community want information, you know, she would be one uh, to talk to about those kind of things or contact information's in here. Uh, M is about water wasting and you already have an ordinance to that effect so you don't have to do anything else. And the plumbing retrofit, again, for the same reason, most of that is covered under legislation as part of your building code now and over time uh, all houses will eventually have to have uh, to comply with water conserving fixtures in them. 
And with that, I can answer any questions you have. I'll told uh, the, the demand management measures, uh, if you implemented them all, um, it would cost about another $125,000 a year that you'd have to cover somehow if you wanted to just implement it all. And you might save about $7,000 worth of water, which is why you don't have to do it. Now, you're free to do it, and if you want to, then you don't have to worry about how you fund it. But uh, we're submitting this to DWR such that you comply with the law without having to do that yet, given the uh, current financial situations. And with that, I can take any questions you have on the document. As I understand, this is the first hearing, and that I believe towards the end of November you'll formally adopt it, um, and then should be good to go. I, if I don't hear that there's going to be major changes, I'm going to go ahead and send this to DWR uh, in the next you know few days. But uh, if uh, over the course of the public comment time and everything, if there are any changes, I'll gladly work with uh, your staff and we'll talk to DWR to make sure it's uh, not a big deal and we'll report back to you uh, one way or the other at your final adoption hearing. If there are stuff you want that they have a problem, we'll make sure you know what the problem might be and why and you can address that at that time. But that, uh, with that, I'll take any questions or... Uh, this open the public comment period or public hearing? Um, this. The public comment can be accepted this evening. There's not a 30-day public comment hearing period, but we will take comments from the public throughout this process, even though it's not a formal process. I have a question. Uh, uh, just one more. Uh, there's a couple areas still in your plan that has uh, city input, and we all set for all of that. Yeah, I believe so. I think there, those were things like having the final ordinances and... Uh, let me see what a couple of others. If you had specific examples, I know that uh, yeah, I'm just looking through, and I tried to highlight issues like that in there, so right, it was clear did, that they would be. You did a good job doing that. Thank you. Yeah, things like what dates, like when tonight's meeting was, for instance, and when the final meeting would be. We were at the beginning of your document. Yeah, and I don't see any others. Just flipping through quickly, but. Okay. All right, and if we meet our goal of 20% reduction by 2015, would we have additional reduction requirements by the state? Not under current legislation, but, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've sat in the state board meetings, and I wouldn't want to guess where they might go given the, uh, if the drought keeps going. Oh, my question was, um, do we currently have a uh, emergency restriction uh, water use plan, or do we still need to prepare one? You have a plan in here that, again, the stages I was talking about, uh, and, and that's, that's sufficient for what DWR needs. If you think you want more, you're free to do that and direct staff to protect it further, but you have what they require at this oh, point. Just the state requirements yeah. is what I was asking, so right. that's, that's fine. And I had tabletop that uh, exercise. <laughs> I just had a quick question. If we do put the recycling piece in there, does it obligate us to do it, or can we opt out? I mean, if we well, put it in there, are we mandated to do it? What I don't believe so, and I think what I'd recommend is you word it such that, you know, you intend to like do this to and that you there? would be pr proceeding through preliminary planning and design and all that, and that gives you an out if it doesn't and work out for whatever we reason. I would withhold that and go for the 2016 version. Um, see where we are when the new water bill comes, bond comes on out, where the funding is and what we can capture, and then do our plan and then insert it into it. Um, I believe that would also help with our, our um, some of the retrofitting that they mm -hmm. may require in the future, that the whole city is retrofitted. Uh, therefore, uh, some of the, the private and commercial would not have to be retrofitted. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the public? Seeing none. I bring this back, and we did review the draft urban water management plan. Yes. 
And Mayor members of the council, this will be available for the public. Uh, we'll put it on the website so they can download that electronically. Anybody who is interested in looking at this in further detail. Thank you. Item 7, consistent of item 7.1, staff comments? Yes. Um, Mayor members of the city council, I would like to bring up um, Chief Kiley and followed by Sue Fitzpatrick to uh, give a little update on the cheese and wine. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'd like to point out that this was a team effort through and through. And uh, to further emphasize that, I know that I saw virtually all of you at Cheese and Wine, um, your maybe somewhat tired but smiling faces there, uh, giving even more of yourselves to the community. So uh, I consider myself in good company to be amongst those that not only talk the talk but walk the walk and give so much of themselves to this community. So um, working with Sue and Mike, I know that uh, there was uh, Riverbank Police Services played a small part in the event planning. Um, it was quite a combined effort working with Chris Ricky presents as well. Um, I know we put on some training with the alcohol servers that uh, was done in, co in concert with Chris Ricky presents and Kimberly Humke who works with peer recovery. Um, and through that training, it emphasized responsible alcohol uh, pouring and reminded people of their obligation to uh, check IDs and and make sure they weren't serving obviously intoxicated subjects. And the reason that I mention all this is that uh, in my nine or so years working the event, this was the most peaceful cheese and wine that that I've ever participated in. Um, and I think a large part of that can be attributed to the the very responsible and disciplined uh, serving of alcohol. Um, I don't. I, the only intoxicated subject that we had that I'm aware of that required uh, our services was somebody that decided to go into one of the local restaurants and fall asleep. Um, I think they had gotten a head start on the party before they ever showed up to Cheese and Wine. <laughs> um, and they were turned over to a family member, so it was a very uneventful uh, detail for us to work, and uh, which speaks volumes of the community and, and the uh, coordination effort. So uh, medical aids, um, traffic and parking problems were really how we stayed busy and, and we weren't all that busy. So in any event, are there any questions? You guys did a f uh, fantastic job. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you. There, there wasn't a lot of work to be done. <laughs> I think oh, district and, presence and made, made a big difference. I know for us it did. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Sure, but when you, when you work crowds that police themselves, it's a, it's a pleasure. So, thank you. Mayor, members of the council, yeah, one of the entertaining parts I thought was just watching the police services close it, down the event. And I know my grandkids <laughs> thought it was so neat with the mounted horses, and it, it was. It was kind of neat to watch that. I had never seen that before, and it went really smooth. Anyway, um, you know, I think the event was a success in some ways. Uh, my staff were pretty hard on ourselves. We wanted all to be really good, and we know that the cheese and wine part wasn't what we wanted it to be. Uh, we learned a lot. The contracted service that we worked with learned a lot. Um, I think even though we listened to everything Rotary said, they warned us about all the things that we experienced. Um, you have to do it to experience it and learn from it, I think. Um, and we have and we know what needs to be done. I don't know if we're going to do this event again or, or what's going to come of that, but if we are directed to do it again, um, we do know what needs to be done to make it even better. Um, financially, I think you'll be pleased. I don't have all the numbers yet, but I do know uh, that I can be pretty confident in saying that we didn't make a lot of money, but we didn't lose a lot of money. I think we're right where we wanted to be. So I'll be able to get all that together and maybe we could do a, a report of some type um, just to give you a little bit more detail of, of that. But the staff and I were joking, it was kind of like the game whack-a-mole. We'd come in and we'd hear a problem and we'd fix it and then another one would pop up and it was just constant. So we learned a lot and, and really now we're kind of laughing about it a little bit, but we are wishing that the whole thing would have been as good as we hoped it would be. But moving on. 
Um, we have the hayride coming up, and we're moving into that, and that's going to be the 24th and 25th of October. Um, we rely heavily on volunteers. We usually about use about 70 volunteers. We're looking for more as we pull this together in the next couple weeks, but I hope everyone comes out. Um, I think this event we do pretty much have down pat because we've done it for like 14 years, so um, I hope everyone comes out and enjoys that. If you have any questions or anything. Oh. you need volunteers for that hayride? We do. We're still kind of putting all that together. We're doing pretty, pretty well, but um, we still could use more. Okay, I was hoping. <laughs> okay, thank you. I would like to compliment the entire staff. A, a, a project like the Cheese and Wine does not go off without everybody touching it. And as the chief mentioned, it was teamwork. And public works, finance, my office, every office had something to do with it. Um, I, I do have to just compliment the chief. I do believe that his presence and the presence of, of the deputies throughout the throughout the event did set the tone for a very safe and secure environment. I'd also like to compliment the recreation staff who were there behind the scenes dealing with issues like Sue mentioned. And I'd like to specifically point out Sue, who from the very beginning was willing to take this on and said, I think we can do it. If the council wants us to do it, I think we can do it if we get an event organizer. And so adding this on to a very um, ambitious recreation program for a staff made up of, of basically two full-time rec staff um, and the rest with part-timers. I, I just, my hat goes off to Sue for the work that she put into this and the sleepless nights that she had making, sh you know, wanting to make sure everything would go well. Our primary goal was we'd have a safe and fun event and we accomplished that goal. So with that, I'm very proud of the city and proud of Parks and Rec and our affiliation with the Sheriff's Department. I'd like to thank Captain Gordon uh, for coming here this evening as well and participating. He has uh, been very communicative with the city. Uh, very much appreciate that partnership. And we will have, um, and I love it when the chief says he's had an uneventful weekend, day, event. That is what we love to hear from the chief of police. So we do have though, a special event I just wanted to make every aware of in part of our emergency preparedness this coming um, Thursday, October 16th at 1016 a.m. We are going to be participating in the great shakeout drill. Uh, Norma Torres Manriquez is our emergency manager and she is going to be coordinating that for us. So um, those of anybody who might be visiting City Hall on Thursday morning, we, we, you might get to participate with us. Uh, so just it's a practice run to be able to make sure that we're, we're doing our, our exit and uh, emergency preparedness is one of those things that you can always do lots more of. We always need to do lots more of. And you've never, ever done enough on the day after of an emergency. So uh, we are trying to incorporate it in our strategic planning. And when we can, we want to work with that. So I want to uh, just to thank and thank her for her efforts uh, of working with the county on emergency preparedness. So again, it is going to be watch for the, the events. So again, Hayride, Christmas Parade, lots going on in the city of Riverbank this holiday season. So thank you for your support. Thank you. All right, Council Member Jones Cruz, please. I just wanted to um, thank the chief and Sue and and all and their crew and all the city staff for just a fabulous cheese and wine festival. Um, I think one of my favorite parts was sitting out on the grass with everybody else and watching people walk by. It just was awesome to see um, this beautiful place out here in front being used by what I think people intended it when they saw the vision to put that in there. It was really awesome to be a, be a part of that and, and see Riverbank shine and um, I appreciate Fast Eddie's comments about that too. Um, it was just, I, I came down here on Thursday to do some business and I turned around and was heading um, out of town and I looked in my rearview mirror and the uh, Ferris wheel was up already and the sun was setting and I got the most beautiful picture. I had to turn around and there wasn't anything in the street except for the sun setting and this Ferris wheel. It looked like some European city. It was really, really awesome. <laughs> it's now, you know, a large photo in my house because it was really that cool. <laughs> so if you haven't seen it, it's on my Facebook. It was a beautiful picture. Um, and it just was a really neat weekend to be uh, part of Riverbank. So thank you guys for all of your hard work. Can I in, interrupt one moment? There, uh, just as I stopped, I, I did. I, I wanted to make two things. One is to thank all of the volunteers who helped make this possible, all of our sponsors who helped make this event possible. I know a lot of you are all affiliated with community organizations, but you know, I clearly see my staff, and I want to compliment my staff, but I also want to recognize that we could have not done it without a, a community partnership. 
and everybody coming out and everybody who came and had a good time. We are so grateful for that. And those that have comments, we are noticing, we, we are taking comments for how to improve it next year. We welcome those comments, both for what we did well and what we need to improve on through Facebook and other things. We are monitoring those. And so welcome welcome those that feedback and, and do want to thank everybody who, who came as well and, and each one of you for participating as, as part of the community, the community groups that there. So anyway, I apologize that I did not say that in my initial comments. But. No, that's it. Thank you. Councilmember Barbara Martinez. Um, our citywide walk or bike to school day on October the 8th was a success, and thank you to everyone that participated. Um, and thank you also to Jill and to Cal for covering our, uh, helping me to cover our, uh, our schools at that event. Um, and I was also very pleased that our efforts that we uh, participated in our, um, our strategic planning session and the financial assessment and forecasting uh, sessions that we had, um, I think that with all of us working together with our key city staff and the council that we're moving and making decisions to move our city uh, forward in the right direction. And um, I, too, think that the Cheese and Wine event was very successful. And I look forward to having it again next year. Um, and also, um, I had the opportunity to participate in the San Joaquin Expanding Your Horizon uh, hands-on workshop. Um, this was an, uh, a workshop for um, students from grades 6 to 12. It was mostly young ladies. And it introduced them to um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And there were approximately 500 students that were there. It was really uh, a very exciting and awesome event. And just an announcement about SEPA, which is our Senior Elder Abuse Prevention Alliance. Um, they're going to hold a workshop on October the 24th at our community center from 9 to 1. Thank you. Councilmember Tucker. Uh, I just want to say I agree with all the comments that were made about the Cheese and Wine Festival. It was a fantastic event. I thought it was um, hot, really successful for our very first outing and taking it over. Um, I congratulate and applaud and give major kudos to Sue and her, her staff, uh, Chief and his staff, all of our, uh, as, as uh, Jill said, all of our uh, community volunteers, um, community service organizations. It definitely was a team effort. and. And uh, I think it went really, really well. Um, there obviously is always a few things that we can tweak and make it even better for next year. But for our first outing, I thought it was fantastic. So well done, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. I'd just like to say that I would like to encourage people to go to some of the local fire board meetings. I attended one the other day, and uh, there were only two people there. And the funny thing was, it's supposed to be a public hearing. There's a lot that goes on at them that affects you. Uh, they talk about rate structures. They're talking a lot about safety with the railroads because there's some big issues with that. And I will tell you that they are working with the county on making sure that the railroads are safe coming through our community. So I would encourage you to go to their meetings on the second Thursday of each month. You can check it on the websites just in case they change one. But it'd be nice to see a little bit more participation there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I just have a couple of comments. First, we did the financial forecast, and in that, some of the areas that we discussed were um, explosive international situations. Um, just very briefly, things that uh, I was quite interested in when we did our forecast. Although I consider that one area to be explosive, I did not expect Ebola to be here in the United States. With that trans transiting transitioning across the pond, there could be a lot more devastating than we first initially um, looked at. And that may affect national as well as international commerce. So we have to stay aware of how that affects from Texas now uh, transitioning across borders to um, our state and, again, could affect us locally. The Boys and Girls Club um, has been going on for one year in Stanislaus County, and they're looking for places to expand. And hopefully we can get the uh, Boys and Girls Club here in Riverbank to assist with the lights on, keep the lights on. Uh, United Way also has a lot of um, 
incentives to come here. So uh, with that, I think uh, with the school board and um, the school, Riverbank Unified School District, talking with the uh, Boys and Girls Club, maybe we could uh, get uh, a club here in the city of Riverbank to um, effectively serve our youth. Um, I'm just going to go to one final comment. I, I agree with Cheese and Wine, a lot of the other ones. I'm very proud of the staff here in the city of Riverbank. I have full faith and confidence in the staff. I have full faith and confidence in you as the city manager and that there is no intention by this city council at this time to even look at a possible reprimanding or removal. That we have such faith and confidence in her abilities that we have given her the direction and she has been executing our policies uh, without prejudice and in great um, zeal and competence. So thank you very much. I also have very faith, uh, strong faith and confidence in um, our uh, attor city attorney and the team that they have. And I uh, look forward to a very long and continuous um, association. Again, to all the staff, I want to thank you for your efforts in keeping this city going forward. Uh, I do not want to have it go backwards, nor do I want to have petty disputes be aired in front of the city council uh, for without uh, the individuals realizing the, the damage that they could do to themselves personally. With that, we move to closed session with LRA item 8.1, Conference with Real Property Negotiator, Government Code Section 54956.8, Property APN 062-031-007, 062-031-006-062-008-009. Agency Negotiator Jill Anderson, City Manager, Property Negotiator U.S. Army, under negotiation price terms of payment or both. LRA item 8.2, Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, Significant Exposure to Litigation Pursuant to Subdivision Bravo of Government Code 54956.9, one potential case. Item 8.3, Conference with Legal Counsel, Existing Litigation Pursuant to Council Code 54956.9, Alpha. Name of case, Adrian Allen and Francis Allen versus the City of Riverbank. Stanislaus County Superior case number 670739. Before we go to closed session, is there anyone from the public wishing to comment on the, the closed session? Seeing none, we're now adjourned to closed session.
The regular city council and local redevelopment authority meeting is re, um, reconvened. reconvened. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> item 9.1, report from closed session LRA 8.1, conference with real property negotiators. This item was not discussed. LRA item 9.2, report from closed session LRA item 8.2, conference with legal counsel, anticipated legal, uh, anticipated litigation. A direction has been provided to staff. Item 9.3, report from closed session item 8.3, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. The city has come to an agreement with the Allen case. It is the sole expense the city will demolish and raz all structures from the Allen property to be completed within 180 days of the effective date of settlement agreement, which is tonight. The city will remove all encumbrance on the property, uh, liens, etc., within 30 days of the completion of the demolition of the property. The city agrees to perform routine maintenance, reduce weeds, rubbish, garbage accumulation, etc., on the property at its own cost as long as the property remains vacant. The city agrees to forgive the remaining loan pro portfolio of approximately $5,400. The city waives all future development fees for the property will only apply to plaintiffs, not to any further future owner. Plaintiffs will still have to comply with all development standards, regulations, ordinances, etc. The city forgives the remaining balance for the housing rehabilitation loan for the property in 1988 based on uh, discussion with the state rep. The city must repay outstanding amount of, to the fund it cannot be written off. Within 30 days of the effective date, the city will, will pay plaintiffs $275,000 in full settlement of the lawsuit. This document will, be main, will become public once uh, signed. With that, oh, and uh, the agreement for this uh, uh, settlement was a was 5-0 vote. With that, the city council is now adjourned.